Hi, this is Grasha Brown, and I love fragments. I collect bits of wire, frayed fabric, ripped cardboard, broken bits of ceramics, and chips of paint, the ends of notebooks, seed pods, ripped paper, and the trim tails of yarn and ribbon. I love these small items desperately and completely, as they are the evidence of human activity over time in daily life. For me, small remnants are proof of the labor and activity that create our world. Objects did not magically spring into being, but paper and ink were needed to record data and ideas. Fabric is sewn into clothes and eventually wears down. Concrete is mixed and applied to create pavement. Um, and paint needs to be mixed and applied to walls and canvas. All of these activities require tools and materials and almost always leave behind some sort of material evidence that an activity took place. I love that material records mundane events, the way a mug's handle might chip from too much rumbling in a cabinet, or pavement might crack from many years worth of use and freezing and thawing. This fondness of debris has always been with me and has deeply shaped the development of my artwork. So today I would like to share the development of my current work of and about ceramic fragments, as well as some contemporary artists that work with the ceramic fragment in their work. My earliest fascination with the fragment was pavement cracks. There was a time when I obsessively photographed and cataloged cracks in sidewalks and foundations and building walls. Of course, the color and textures were appealing to me, but I was more fascinated with the hidden layers of old pavement and building facades that are exposed when the material cracks apart. The sidewalk cracks became a kind of cloud gazing exercise. The more I studied the cracks, the more I would see objects and creatures hidden in the sidewalk lines. I used this gazing exercise as inspiration for narrative paintings, featuring the characters, animals, and environments from the sidewalk cracks. My painting surfaces were built up using scrap wood, cardboard, collage, and paint to develop a deeply layered surface that might have mimicked the overlapping layers visible in the sidewalk. Around the same time, I was also discovering ceramics, and so it was natural for me to bring the characters and environments that I was painting onto the ceramic vessel. And eventually I drew these characters out into different ceramic sculptural forms. About halfway through my graduate program, I went to a museum lecture by Marek Sekula, a Polish ceramic artist and writer. He shared several pieces that he had been working on, and I was struck by how sensitive his work was to the changing history of ceramics and the role of clay and ceramics in society. The porcelain carpet installation that is shown here was created from over 500 commercially made ceramic plates from a Polish ceramic factory. Sekula painstakingly photographed details of a hand-woven Persian rug, enhanced the images, and created image transfers that were then applied to the ceramic plates. This piece is very large. It's about 10 by 20 feet, and you can find it installed in different ways in different galleries. But it always creates this tension between the viewer and the handmade digital and ceramic object. Um, the histories of all of these objects are woven together in this piece. And we can think about how the factory made object replaced the handmade and then the digital replaces both the handmade and the factory made. And they all exist together with the viewer kind of grasping at ways of interacting with it. All of the domestic objects in this space cannot be used for their original purpose. The beautiful handwoven rug that has been digitized cannot be walked on, and the mass-produced ceramic plates cannot be eaten from. In this way, uh, Secula discusses the relationship between traditional handmade materials and techniques and new technologies and manufacturing, and how 
we as humans try to interact with all of that. Typically, the ceramic creative process involves manipulating some kind of moist raw clay body in the creation of original forms. After a form is sculpted, it is fired and glazed and made permanent. Before the clay is fired, it can always be recycled. Unwanted forms can be broken down into a workable clay body and reused, but once it is fired, ceramics is a permanent, unchangeable form. Sekula's lecture made me reconsider clay and ceramics as a raw material. Clay is certainly a material that could be shaped into a form and convey an artist's concept, but I had not yet considered that fired ceramic is also a type of raw material that has an inherent meaning and function that can also be used to create original artwork. Similarly, the English artist Paul Scott works with discarded commercially manufactured 19th century ceramic ware with distinctive Delft ware blue imagery. Traditionally, this blue and white dinnerware has images of flowers, landscapes, and pastoral life in a distinctive dark blue color. Using precise techniques, Scott cuts, obscures, and glazes over the existing 19th century images in order to comment on contemporary events. In the Syria series, Scott takes an original commercial dinner plate um, that has an idealized scene of 19th century Damascus and partially erases that scene that we see in a faded blue color and superimposes a scene of destruction from the Syrian war using the same distinctive dark blue color. Scott also uses high-tech cutting methods to modify ceramic ware. In his flower pot and cutting series, individual elements of the commercial plate design are cut out and presented as organic botanical cuttings that might thrive in a contemporary world. The artist Lisa Clegg also works with commercial ceramic objects, developing a technique that upcycles found ceramic figurines into new artwork. So she uses these very sweet mass produced figurines um, that we can all find like in thrift stores or, you know, in a family member's living room um, and then builds these new features in clay on top of the figurine. So new heads, new, um, you know, new narrative elements um, and then refires these figurines multiple times in order to build up um, these surfaces. So she has this wonderful washed out and worn surface of the commercial figurine and then this distinctive handmade surreal elements that stand in direct contrast with the mass produced features. So all of these artists are interrupting the ceramic life cycle, right? They are utilizing existing fired ceramics as a raw material to create their new original artwork. So their work is not resisting um, ceramics. It is not resisting like the found element of commercial ceramics, but they're utilizing that form as an essential element of their work's meaning. So whether you call it recycling or upcycling or found object artwork, the practice of reusing found objects relates very, um, very closely to an anxiety that I have, um, what I like to call maker's guilt. So while I believe that it is an essential human experience to create art, and it is incredibly important that everyone explores art materials and makes art for themselves or for others, I also have an awareness that when I choose to work in clay, I am creating objects that will never go away. So if what I make is not successful, um, if it breaks, if someone buys it and then wants to get rid of it, um, ceramics will ultimately wind up in a landfill, right? So as someone who wants to live as sustainably as possible, um, the ceramic life cycle is a little concerning. This is representative of the work I was making at the time. I am still very much grounded in the imagery from the sidewalk cracks. Um, but as I'm starting to rethink the ceramic life cycle, I also am considering different ways I could interrupt the ceramic life cycle. 
um, how I can use found objects, how I can reimagine old work, and also how building sculptures um, itself could be changed. Um, so I really liked the idea of interchangeable component sculptures. Um, I designed a system where a sculpture was designed from individual components, um, and then each individual component would be f created, fired, and surfaced individually, um, but each component would have an any Audi key, um, similar to the tapered interlock hardware here. Um, so the idea is that each component would be individually constructed and finished, and then I could interchange the pieces by keying and epoxying them together. And if I wanted to change a formation, I could just fire the epoxy out of the interlocks and reuse the pieces or continue to add on to each component. So with this piece, um, you can see that there are three different kind of individual components. There are two kind of organic forms um, on either side of, um, of a leg form. Um, so each of these forms were created separately, and each one had a male or female lock, which were then epoxied together to create this piece. Right. Um, so this, um, this system um, had a lot of issues, um, but I did really enjoy the freedom that it allowed me. Refiring ceramic objects um, was, has, is always fascinating to me. Um, I really love how the context um, is immediately changed when a commercial object is refired, right? Um, so I also started exploring ways of bringing in um, found commercial ceramic objects um, and also reinterpreting old ceramic sculptures, right? Um, with each found fired ceramic object, I would build up layers of paper clay and casting slip um, to act as an interface um, to introduce the found object into new sculptural forms and environments. Um, so with this wall piece, which is from about 2012, um, I have a commercial rabbit figurine embedded in an organic terracotta sculptural piece. Um, this piece survived out of the kiln for about a day or so, um, and then it was unceremoniously fell from the wall while it was being photographed. So this is undeniably a bummer, um, but because I was becoming comfortable using ceramics as a raw material, um, the broken rabbit wall piece became this freestanding sculpture. Like I was able to add on additional components um, and kind of reimagine it as its own freestanding piece. A quick aside about ceramic souvenirs, the ceramic figurine souvenir. Um, little knickknacks like this are very, very odd to me. Um, sometimes they are souvenirs of specific places or experiences, um, like the vacation in the Bahamas. Um, but often these figurines are just these very odd, whimsical thoughts, like the pig in the bathtub. Um, sometimes they are very decorative, you know, very colorful, like the, um, like the deer in the forest figurines on the far right. Um, but often they don't really seem to be connected to anything. Like they're very random sometimes. Um, you know, perhaps there is like a, a, a perceived predilection in consumers, you know, like people collect pigs or cows or, you know, whatever. Um, so the tchotchke series plays on this idea of the souvenir um, and how random they sometimes are. Um, I collected a bunch of different ceramic figurines from junk stores and then built additions um, in clay and glaze off of the figurines to obscure in varying degrees the original. Um, so there is this tension in the Tchotchke series between the recognizable mass-produced figurine um, and this gestural, colorful, um, half-thought-out, abstract form that both distracts and plays off of the original form. Um, so I like to think of these as souvenirs of the subconscious. Typically, when I'm reusing old artwork, um, there's a lot of um, different engineering that has to happen um, in order to fix the artwork together. 
Um, so I need to find different kinds of adhesives. I need to explore different filler materials that would be good to create um, different bonds and transition points between the um, found objects or the older artwork. Um, paper, clay, and casting slip are ceramic options that have to go through a kiln. Um, but I also became really interested in cold, unfired options like mortar, um, concrete, epoxy putty, wire, um, things like that. So in this piece, um, the concrete cake rain, there, there are tons of um, ceramic materials in this piece. Like there's, there's terracotta, there's slip, there's decals, there's glaze. Um, but then if you look um, at this close up, you can also see that there are um, different types of mortars. Um, there's a tile adhesive that is affixing the yellow and green florets to the piece. Um, the florets themselves are made out of a colored um, epoxy putty. Um, there's also um, that really rich brown vein kind of going through the middle of the piece, the middle of the detail shot is, um, is a type of terracotta mortar. Um, and then there's also all kinds of different acrylic gels, acrylic mediums. Um, I really, I really delighted in finding as many different colors and textures and patterns um, as possible and just just putting them all together, just mushing them together, um, flaunting like all of the different seam lines, all of the different join lines, um, you know, just creating as much haphazard um, contrasting color and pattern as possible in a single piece. Um, but ultimately, this process, um, whether it's creating like the interlocking tapered keys, whether it's, um, you know, kind of mortaring old mortaring different pieces together. Um, all of this allowed for a very new freedom in the ceramic process for me. Um, and I am at my heart a committophobe. Um, and so I felt I felt free to explore, I felt free to create. And it, there was a little bit of that relaxing of the maker's guilt that I felt. And which I still feel to a certain extent. This horse head component um, has had many, many lives. Um, this is its most recent form, which was completed in 2016. Um, but these are all the different forms that that one component has been involved in over the years. Um, which is interesting because when I put them all together, um, the, the collection kind of provides a chronology of all the different approaches that I've worked with. Um, so in 2012, you can very clearly see the Inni Audi tapered key that is joining the horse head with the other ceramic forms in the collection in that collection. Um, next one over in 2013, um, mixed media is being a little bit more aggressively introduced. Um, you can see an old uh, wire kiln element um, that is kind of wrapping around the form. Um, there are just a ton of different uh, marks and glazes and slips and lusters and decals, like all kinds of information um, being kind of crammed together. Um, it also looks like there might be like some construction foam that is kind of peeking around from the other side of the piece. Um, and then the final piece um, on the far left um, from 2015-ish, um, there's a very clear move towards embracing um, interrupted forms, right? So the horse head is, is sitting atop um, just a collection of all different types of ceramic fragments um, that are um, building out the horse head form, but also supporting the horse head. Slowly, I started moving away from fully formed component pieces and more towards using actual fragments of material. Mixed media, such as found objects, wire, mortar, um, adhesives and different kinds of epoxies were also incorporated into the structure and surfaces. Um, so in these pieces, I'm interested in emphasizing the seams between pieces and also exposing hardware, like the exposed wire that runs through the ceramic, concrete, and putty in this piece. Um, when I examine my interest in fragments, I'm really unpacking what it means to be a fragment. Um, and also as a maker, what it means to be using fragments. Um, 
So th the fragments I was using at this point were sometimes found broken objects, um, but I was also making ceramic forms to break them or purposely allowing objects to disintegrate before or during firing. Um, but this does feel a little artificial. Um, what does it mean when someone specifically makes something to break, break it later or to not care for them? Um, and if I'm interested in the aesthetic and meaning of fragments, how do I find them to create work if I'm not making them? Um, you know, like, do I just hang out near trash bins? Do I assassinate studio mates artwork? Um, do I have to buy my fragments or buy like unwanted objects? Um, so there was a lot of questions that were coming up as I started embracing fragments. I frequently share this image with my classes. Um, as of 2013, this is the oldest known ceramic fragment. It was discovered in the Zhangji province in China, in Southeast China, and dated to about 20,000 years ago. Um, and for me, this image really sums up everything that I love about fragments. Um, from this piece, from this small ceramic object, um, archaeologists can tell that it was a cooking vessel. We can still see the discoloration from heat and open flame along the base of the fragment. Um, and we can also see the irregularities in how the wall was shaped, um, the impression the fingers and tools made. Um, you know, and also we can see these same features um, reenacted when we shape clay today. So from this fragment, I feel several things. I feel the weight of time, right? Like I feel the thousands of years of weathering and the many years of functional activity that impacted and wore down the original vessel that this fragment came from. Um, and I also feel like the lack of activity that preserved and protected the fragments, um, allowing scientists to find it. I can also feel a connection with the early humans from 20,000 years ago. I recognize their act of pinching and forming and decorating a small vessel because I do the same thing in my own studio practice and I watch my own students do the same action of forming vessels and decorating vessels and we all use vessels. So it's also this connection with our early ancestors. Um, the fragment tells a story about human evolution. It provides evidence of early humans learning to cook food and creating objects to store and carry food and supplies. Um, and this object also carries an implied narrative, right? It shows us how it was used for cooking. It references the action of being broken. And then we also have this, um, you know, this idea of being discovered. So I get a lot of emotional and practical information from this little fragment. So any material fragment carries that same kind of um, characteristics. Fragments are typically relatively small, um, and there's also a sense of mobility. Um, I feel like mat material fragments tend to gather together. Um, they tend to be irregular. Um, perhaps they are handheld. Um, they are usually asymmetrical and random and unbalanced, um, and they invite a kind of investigation. They want to be studied. So by definition, fragments are incomplete. They represent a splintering of a whole complete form, which we may or may not know. Um, and the incompletion and lack of balance is kind of rolled into this identity of being a fragment. You know, in these extreme close-ups of fragmented ceramics, I can see how the ceramic object was made. I can see what kind of clay was used to create it. I can see the impressions of material and tools and hands um, that pinched and rolled and created the clay object that the fragments came from. Um, so there's also a sense of implied narratives in fragments. Um, like the Southeast China cooking pot shard, every fragment had a whole with a function and an experience and an action that fragmented the whole. 
something happened intentionally or unintentionally to separate that fragment. So fragments hint at function, they hint at manufacture, and they also hint at action. They tell a story. I also feel that fragments hint at a deeper fragility that we are all susceptible to. Um, like the breaking apart of pavement over time and use, we all experience emotions and weather and actions that break us down in certain ways, um, but will ultimately provide a shared relatable experience. Ceramic fragments are used in many ways in contemporary ceramic sculpture. Robert Harrison constructs hollow steel archways that are filled with discarded bisqueware from the prestigious Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts Residency Program. The discarded ceramic artwork is from artists all over the world who participate in the program at the Archie Bray. The display creates a kind of time capsule um, displaying these abandoned fragments of artwork for viewers to examine. Um, and if you look closely, you can recognize specific artists that have visited the Bray. Yoko Ono is perhaps best known for her music and performance art pieces, but Mend Piece is an interactive piece that invites visitors to sit down and attempt to mend broken teacups and saucers together. Um, string, glue, and tape are provided, um, and people can try different strategies to try to put things back together in some kind of recognizable form. The re results are an inventive collection of Frankensteins of China, um, some echoing the original forms of the vessel, but most take on a brand new sculptural meaning as people have attempted to bind the pieces together. Yi Su Kung is a Korean artist who creates huge sculptural forms from broken ceramic china using the Japanese technique of kintsugi. Kintsugi is an ancient Japanese practice of mending or inlaying cracks in a ceramic vessel with molten gold. The idea is that um, by embracing and celebrating imperfections, a stronger and more beautiful object can be created when you mend it with the molten gold. So in her artwork, Yisu Kung um, meticulously epoxies broken ceramic vessels together. Um, this particular piece is over five feet tall and nearly four feet um, wide in either direction. Um, so while they are not inlaid with a molten gold, they are epoxied together. Um, and then a, a 24 karat gold leaf is used to celebrate and highlight that epoxied scene. So examining the nature of ceramic fragments um, and articulating the characteristics that I most connect with and most love about material also allowed me some space to rethink some strategies and develop specific formats that I felt are most suited to the characteristics of fragments. So my current work explores a few general formats um, that I feel best celebrate the fragments nature, which again, I feel the fragments core nature is small, mobile, precarious and asymmetrical, um, necessarily incomplete, and also somewhat vaguely narrative. So I will collect various sized fragments of different material, um, and I frequently will bind them together to create what I call bundle sculptures. Um, so, you know, I will use different kinds of cord and fabric, um, and while these pieces are sturdy in themselves, um, they don't move around like they stay in one piece, um, the fragments themselves are not truly captured in a form the way they would be if I embedded them all in concrete or mortar. So with these bundle sculptures, when you pick them up, you can really feel all the different pieces kind of wheeze and breathe and shift as they are being moved. Um, I'm particularly fond of a type of t-shirt fabric 
um, that I use as a binding cord because it has such great elasticity that the cord shifts with the frag fragments, but is strong enough to keep everything bound into one place. Um, so the cord just kind of adjusts as the fragments move against each other, um, you know, creating like a great like flexibility within the structure, all while, all while maintaining the same basic form, you know, that I put them in originally. So while I still relate very heavily to ceramic fragments, um, I've also embraced fragments of all different kinds of material. Um, in doing so, I no longer feel the need to create ceramic fragments. Um, I allow fragments to come to me. I allow residual material to come to me um, and just act as a collector and not a creator of fragments. So whether the fragments I'm working with are ceramic or paper or fibers or little bits of metal, um, I do feel this need to protect and orient them so the viewer can comfortably spend time contemplating all of these small pieces um, and then also be rewarded by all of the small details that are present when you spend time with um, momentary fragments of material. So I experimented with encasing different material in stitched clear vinyl um, to create um, small, like kind of globular forms, as well as wall hangings. Um, um, this is perhaps a technique um, that can better be appreciated um, in pre-COVID times, um, but I used to um, kind of actively collect used paper towels um, and used um, paper items from studio trash cans. Um, and so I would take all these, you know, kind of used paper fiber materials, um, completely soak the fibers in a liquid clay body, um, arrange these liquid clay body paper towels and whatnot into different forms, and then fire the, then fire the pieces. So all of the combustibles, like all of the paper towel, all of the debris um, are burned out, um, leaving a ceramic shell that kind of memorializes and celebrates um, this byproduct of cleaning the studio, this byproduct of um, making notes and recording and disposing of your recordings. So this piece, um, is a series of clumps of paper towels that have been dipped in a white liquid clay body um, and then bound together with a uh, with a black uh, waxed linen cord. The fragment vignette series highlights the very small, almost residual fragments um, from the ceramic process. So the base of these forms are created using slip cast forms um, that I combine together to create an almost um, an almost landscape like figurine. And then all of these small residual pieces of clay and glaze and um, broken bits of ceramic um, are all embedded into those slip cast forms. Um, and kind of memorialized and celebrated. Um, so I feel like these are very much like little environments, like little landscapes that can be studied at the viewer's le leisure. Related to this idea of landscape and environment, um, I've recently become very interested in creating homes for fragments, like creating environments for them to live in. Um, so with um, the Nestled series, the hope is that the fragments are very obscure, like the fragments are not immediately obvious and the viewer is required to invest a certain amount of time examining the piece to discover the fragments. So um, in this series, um, I created a series of large, highly textured, highly colored forms on, you know, on like abstracted pedestals um, that are arranged in clusters and the more time that a viewer spends with the piece, the closer that they get, um, they will discover these little broken moments 
embedded on the the highly textured, highly colored um, pieces. This idea of um, safeguarding fra fragments, of creating homes for fragments or little environments is also present in much smaller scales like this, where I'm creating just a very small um, kind of hidey hole with a loose fragment um, for people to explore and discover the fragment within. Thank you for joining me as I've waxed poetic over residue, shards, and material fragments. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone has enjoyed Professor Grosser Brown's artist talk. And we have a couple questions that are coming in. Uh, Professor Brown, how are you being true to yourself within your art? I'm, I'm not sure what I'm being asked. Um, I think I think as like for every step of the way, like as I mean, I started doing this probably like in 2011, 2010, something like that. And I think I had a constant state of questioning. Um, so every time I made something like I would evaluate it, I would kind of check in with myself. Um, and yeah, it was just like this constant state of just evaluating how I was feeling, what I thought I was making, how I was interpreting what I was making. And I, I never allowed pieces to become super precious or, or for process to become super precious. Um, and I think in that way, like I'm, I'm being true to myself with my art. Um, and I'm, if, if that person needs, would like to like have a follow-up question, if I didn't answer that correctly, please let me know. <laughs> yes. And it looks like, um, what was the average time that you spent on each piece, including the planning process, like average time? Um, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I tend to work in cycles. So I would kind of have like, just like a mass of things like that I would just kind of walk around and like tie together. <laughs> um, so, you know, if, um, you know, like with my, with my last, you know, big exhibition, like I feel like it was, I was probably working over the course of like six months to a year. Um, and then I would just have like, you know, however many objects that would come out of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, People will, and maybe I hope I'm not stealing someone's future question, but people will frequently ask me, like, what, you know, when do I know what, when do I know when a piece is done? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not uncommon for a piece just to kind of live on a work table and to get like lots of little adjustments and lots of little, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, periods of reflection. And, um, you know, so it might take, it might take months for me to feel like something is done, even though like, the actual like contact work time is, you know, is not like a full six months. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then what makes a good shard? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, um, I think like, I'm really, I really respond to shards that have um, like little, like kind of hidden, like hidden mm -hmm. treasures, right? Um, so, you know, something, like if it was, you know, I'm just like looking at the stuff on my desk, you know, so like I have a little shard of kind of glaze that is, um, you know, that's like mostly, it's mostly black and blue. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's just like this one area that is just like this incredible, like, you know, like layered, like textured turquoise with like, you know, a little bit of like pink fuzz stuck into it. And like, you know, so I think, um, I think a really good shard is something that has, um, that works on a lot of different levels that has kind of like this unexpected, um, like little treasure in it. Ooh, like a treasure chest every time you find a new shard. It's like a little treasure chest. Yeah. Oh, 
And which stores give you the most inspiration when searching for pieces? Thrift stores or <laughs> antique stores? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, junk stores, junk. like junk stores. Um, I actually, like, if anyone knows of a good junk store around here, like, please let me know. Um, I just, re I remember there was this really great place um, in Pennsylvania that I used to go to, and it was just like, it almost looked like an abandoned storefront, but then like you walked in and it was just boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff just, and you just like went in and just pawed through things. Mm -hmm. And that would always have like the best stuff because it was just things that had been, you know, like boxed up, like God knows when, you know, like who knows like where it came from, but you could like really feel like, um, there was no cleaning, like they were not clean, like they were not like prepared for retail. Um, you know, there were like, you know, big old drills like on top of plates, on top of silverware, mm -hmm. on top of, you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, like those are kind of the best, those are the best stores. Ooh. And then what message do you want people to get from viewing your art? Just. <laughs> um. <laughs> As we go from junk stores to what message? Um, I think, you know, I, I think I, I let the viewer kind of, the viewer is going to have their experience, um, but I think I like to set, I like to set a stage for the viewer to interact and like kind of have these very like, um, quiet moments. Like, mm -hmm. so I think that there is an element of like introspection or, um, or contemplation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that moment of like, let's meditate over this before. Yeah. We get into yeah. So I think, I think there's something inherently meditative because I mean, and that is kind of how I am coming at, that, that is how I experience like mm -hmm. cracks in the sidewalk and fragments and things like that. Ooh. And so do you plan time to go find the shards to use in your work or are they often found at random? Like they come out of the sky, which that would be kind of cool. But um, yeah, I, I think, I think like, you know, like when I, when I was in graduate school and like, you know, like I had very set deadlines and like, I had like a lot of uh, production pressure, like, yeah, of course, like I, I would have to be like, okay, I have to go to the junk shop and then I have to like go through the recycle bin and then I have to like, you know, so it would, it would be kind of like a to-do list. Like it would be very structured. Um, but I think as, I think like as, as like that, that structure is kind of loosened. Um, I mean, things really do just present themselves to people who are looking, you know? <laughs> Um, so I think, um, you know, just walking down the street, cleaning the studio, um, just, you know, yeah, like I, I feel like I let the fragments kind of come and find me now. Um, you know, and also like just working with, I, ho I hope that this was clear. It's like the minute you start working with material, you are creating residue, like you are creating some kind of byproduct. Um, so even though like, I'm not like making things to break them necessarily anymore, mm -hmm. um, just by nature of being a human on this planet, like you are making garbage, like you are making stuff, um, you know, you are making fragments, you are, you know, creating a footprint, you're creating um, this like byproduct of life. So they're there, they're, they're there. They follow, they follow all of us. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then how long does it take to complete a piece because you act as a collector instead of a creator of these fragments, do you keep building up the sculptures over time or make one then move on to another? And I think you might answer part of that. Yeah, no, but I think um, I still like revisit old, old sculptures. Mm -hmm. Like I actually, there's a piece that's been sitting like on my back shelf for a while that it just, it needs, it needs redone. Like it, um, it desperately needs like a different life. So yes, yeah, so I, and I think that that relates back to that, like I'm a committophobe, like I have maker's guilt, like there's kind of this weird anxiety that I'm trying to avoid mm -hmm. like in my art practice. Um, 
so I mean, really, like a piece is never a, a piece is never done. Like there are some pieces that I mean, they're not mine anymore. So you know, like someone else has them, so they are mm -hmm. complete. Um, but like as long as it's in my possession, like it's up, it's up for grabs. Like I, I could, I could decide to rework it or add to it, or break it apart and harvest it or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. Almost I was gonna say almost in a sense like with 2D artists who are like, there's a painting on the wall. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, I forgot to get that little corner fix. So let me go to this gallery and touch it up while it's on the wall. Yeah. Would you do that in a gallery? Like or would you just be like as an act of performance with your piece? Oh, oh. <laughs> um I don't I mean I guess it's never really come up, but I think it would be a really like interesting I think it would be a really interesting thing to put to to have in a gallery, um, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of showcase like the process of it. I mean, things have have broken in transit, and then I've had to sit there in the gallery and kind of like re, you know, retool it, re epoxy it, yeah. things like that. Um, but I think just just going back to that last question, like. I mean, I think that our relationship with our art and mm -hmm. our, you know, like us as artists, like we are, we are not robots. Like we are never done. Like we are always kind of, you know, rethinking, like reflecting, like changing, like how we, like how we perceive things. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's really natural that if you have like an old piece of art, like as your as your experiences inform you, like you're gonna want to go back and change it because it's not like representing you anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, there are some pieces that like I will never change. Mm -hmm. You know, because they're kind of, you know, I don't I don't know. And I say that, but I'm not dead yet either. So, <laughs> you know, I, I might I might very well go back and change them. But there are definitely some things that might, you know, that feel like they're they're done. Like I'm not touching them again. Um, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know if I can articulate why. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you see yourself returning to a 2D art format in the future because you show interest in utilizing the fragments of 2D work a little bit in your earlier pieces? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been doing nothing that, nothing like kind of concrete enough that I could share it. It's not for it's not for sharing yet, but no, I definitely am like looking at like collage forms and kind of you know experimenting with arranging things in more of like a two D or relief format. Um, I became really really interested in shadow boxes, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is still like three D, but it's a little bit more is a little bit closer to, to two dimensional. Um, yeah, yeah. So definitely, like I'm. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> and in your work, there's a tension between memorializing the shards, recording their history, and creating something entirely new. Which element is most important to you? I think that that's that's like the that's like the that's the question. Like, I think that that is that's like the, the conversation I have with myself with like every single piece. Um, you know, I think, like, especially with like the more recent stuff, like when I was creating like, you know, almost like little like containers or holders for the fragment and the fragment itself was very much like not, not um, informed at all. Mm -hmm. I think that that was kind of the direction that I was moving in. And I think it was becoming really important that um, the fragment is the, the, fra the I'm creating something new to present the fragment. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I think it, it does depend on the fragment and I don't really, I don't want to get into like, um, it, like I'm not good at building displays. Like my pedestals are terrible, um, so I don't. So I, yeah, I think I think it's. I think I'm kind of going in this direction where it's, um, where like, where I'm living somewhere in between. You know, like I'm trying to kind of have it both ways. Um, 
Yeah. And what do you find appealing about recontextualizing or inverting the original meaning of a piece? Inverting um, the original meaning. I think I think that when you know when we like when we buy something when we see something like when we read something you know we're taking in like this original like this original product like this original whatever um, and then it gets shot through a prism it gets digested um, you know, we start like in, we start relating things back to it. We start kind of like mentally um, putting it into a box and mentally like kind of collecting similar things or like contrasting things. Um, and so I think that when you when you're when you're working with found objects, um, you and like however you are doing that, like whether it's a found up, whether it's an assemblage or um, recycled art or whatever, you are like kind of making that digestion visible in a way. Um, you're, you're showing like this internal, like nebulous process mm -hmm. of thinking and digesting and um, discussing, um, which, I mean, so I think that that's really interesting. Like, I think, um, I think that we all know that to, we all know to some extent that everyone like is interpreting things and um, when you're viewing information like you're always like simultaneously right and wrong um, and everyone has their own perception but like when but yeah like when you're kind of making that process visible like in visual in visual art like um, yeah I don't know I just I think it's I think it's just like a different I think it's good to highlight stuff like that. It's good to remember. It's good to remember that we're all going through this on some level. And what advice do you have to students today here, either at VCSU or whoever's turning, tuning in and watching right now? Yeah. Um, uh, make a lot and break a lot. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, just, oh, oh, the answer is always in your studio. Just, just make, just make. And I would also say like, let, um, like go to those pla go to those like little tiny places that are really really interesting to you and that and you don't know why they're interesting and just like ex and just unpack it you know because I think that that is where you get all these really interesting like super personal um, approaches and 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 you know that's where your narrative lives like that's kind of where you'll find like why you make what you make. <laughs> And then with your pieces of fragments, was it mostly between high fire, low fire um, in the firing process for mm -hmm. that last process into um, ceramics or was it a mixture of both? Um, i trying to think back. I think I, well, I mean the, the ceramic fragments themselves they could have been fired, fired any, you know, at any range. Mm -hmm. There was a time when I was working a lot with porcelain, like, mm -hmm. like when I was dipping like paper towels into, into, into slip, like that was porcelain. So I think I did, I did do a lot of high, I did high fire those so that I could kind of get that, um, you know, that nice, like dense mm -hmm. porcelain look. Um, I feel like most of it, though, most of it is low fire. Like most of it is, um, you know, kind of like right, hovering right around two thousand degrees. Um, you know, and all, and that's also because, like, the more you the more you refire things, um, you can only ask like so much from a piece of ceramics. <laughs> like, eventually, it will it will break down in a way for me that is undesirable 
um, you know, like at a certain point, like the work about fragments will break itself down and then it, there's nothing really to look at anymore. Um, so yeah, it tends to be just like right around kind of 2000 degrees. Exactly. Yeah. And also a lot of the glazes I use are low fire too. Yeah. Have you made a piece yet that has gone down as you were talking about the low fire, like just to the powder of like it's back to powder yet? Or have you, do you want to push it that far or do you just want to keep the building of fragments? Um, I, well, I, I never did this on purpose, but I did, um, I have fired things because a lot of times, like when you get, when you get these kind of found ceramic objects, like they don't come with a label. Like they don't tell you, you know, oh, this was fired to, you know, 2,500 degrees and, you know, um, so I, I have like fired things that, um, you know, they kind of, they don't, they don't go down to powder, but they just kind of like fold in on themselves and they get really like melty and really molten. Um, yeah, and it's just like, it's just a different, it's just a different form of fragmentation and residue, I guess. So I'm into it. <laughs> and I know in the most of your work, um, you do a lot of small, what has been the largest piece you have made? Not super big, not super big. It's probably that ne the the nestled series, um, mm -hmm. those three pieces together, um, you know, that are like wood and ceramics and fibers, um, and that is probably each like each one of those like three objects is about about four feet tall. Okay. So, um, you know, so like you can walk around them and like you do have to bend down a little bit to, you know, to kind of look inside, but it's low enough that you can like look over the top of it and then, um, you know, interact with it. I think that that's, that's probably the biggest I've gone, um, you know, and I've, yeah, I just, I really, I, I tend, I've always tended to be more comfortable with like very like small, like handheld things, um, you know, and then the challenge is of course, like making that like really small thing, um, you know, placing it in a way that people can still see it and, you know, and like interact with it. Yeah. <laughs> Without walking away with it. Without walking away, yeah, no, that's, and, <laughs> I know you're going on an art residency coming up very soon this summer. What's your plan or what can you share planning? Because I know as artists, we're kind of like very sometimes secretive of what we're doing. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I'm not really like, I'm not, I'm not secretive. It's more like, um, if I, if I, if I'm being elusive, it's only because, um, mm -hmm it wouldn't make sense. Mm -hmm. There's not like, there's nothing, there's nothing like visually or verbally to really share. Um, no, but the plan right now um, is, is to focus, is to focus on doing kind of more to 2D ish or relief work. Um, yeah. Like that's, that's kind of the plan right now. Like I'd like to, um, you know, I have kind of a couple of containers of things that I really want to work with. I have some unfinished work that I'd like to try to finish. Um, but yeah, like a lot of like mixed media and a lot of, um, yeah, like a lot of like paper and fiber. Yeah. So kind of stepping a little bit away from the ceramics or? I mean, just, you know, for the residency, um, yeah, for the res, I mean, I think I'm bringing, I'm bringing ceramic fragments with me. Um, yeah, but like I won't be, I won't be firing. I won't be making and firing. And just seeing, does anybody else have any questions who's tuning in? Just want to give a few other seconds just to make sure in case there's like a, oh my gosh, we have to ask this question. <laughs> and I guess maybe a last question as we're waiting, what advice can you give to people who are non-artists who or wanting to take like a ceramics or art class? Oh, um, good advice. Um, 
Well, definitely, definitely make like, you know, take a, definitely take a class, like any class that you're interested in or like open studio situation that you can find. Um, and I think like, um, how do I'm trying to think how to say this? Um, like whatever, whatever your, like whatever class you're in, like if you're in a drawing class or like a clay class, um, like listen, listen to the material, like watch like kind of how the material is, is working with you and working against you, um, you know, and don't get like too hung up on process, um, you know, like, like kind of explore, you know, you know, pay it. I mean, obviously like, you know, pay attention to the techniques you want to learn, but um, yeah, like kind of ex uh, approach it with like a spirit of exploration. So it looks like we have no other questions that has come in. So again, thank you, Professor Brown, Grasha Brown, for giving your process here to all the BCSU students, faculty, staff, alums, and just to anybody who's tuning in, thank you for watching here, of hearing more about our awesome 3D professor <laughs> here at BCSU. Um, as we finish up, this talk, we have another talk coming up very soon on April 13th, showcasing our VCSU senior Xander Dale for his senior exhibition on April 13th at 11 a.m. So please save the date and time and we hope to see you then soon. If you have any questions, feel free to follow us again on Facebook, Instagram, and have a great afternoon, folks. Thank you.